Hi, my name is Eddie Odiambo. I am head of football at Velocity and I am born in Tanzania, raised predominantly in Oxford and the forms tell me that I'm a black African. Hi, my name is Leah Anthony. I'm head of women's football at City. Um, my heritage, my mum is actually from Wales and my dad is from the Caribbean in a little island called St Vincent. Alia, your experience in football, what, what unique challenges do you think you faced in football? Um, I mean, when I was younger, it was mostly the case of obviously being probably the only female in that football team. I used to play Fox and Blackbirds when I was younger. Um, in terms of race, that was also something that was there. I was the only, you know, I was the only mixed race girl there, um, which again, I was there for being the only female, and then I was there for obviously being the only mixed race girl. So growing up, I, I think me and Eddie spoke about it a little bit. It's it's hard to look at it and see, right, am I being, is people acting different towards me because of my colour, or am I, you know, getting different reputation because of my colour? Um, it, if I'm honest, it doesn't really affect me in football. Um, there might be comments on the pitch when I've grown up, when, I'm, when I've obviously got older, which affected me, but it, it, it doesn't really affect me on the pitch because I just turn an eye to it and I focus on the game. I think outside of football there are obviously bigger issues and everyone's going to have their own experiences, but for me it was more the case of turning a blind eye to comments, um, ignoring comments and being the bigger person, just to say, you know, you're silly for saying that and moving on. Excellent. So I was speaking with a gentleman called Paul Curtin, who's managing director of Team Grassroots. Um, he said the football doesn't care about how you look, it just wants to be played with. So his thinking is that actually football doesn't have as much of a racism problem as society does. W what do you both think about this? I would, within the game itself, I would, I would agree in terms of amongst the players. Um, it largely is driven by society, how people are treated within a change room. So my experience of a change room 20 plus years ago in my formative years is different to what it is to what I see now. Um, so for example, I, between 60, between the ages of 15, 19, even my, some of my early 20s as well, you go into a, a change room and it'll be the staff saying, oh, here he comes, here we go, the brothers are all coming in together, or they're all sitting there on a the table together. And that was the culture the accepted terminology, it was what was permitted by those who are picking the team, sorting out contracts, that was the language that was permitted, so it was actually, it was ongoing. And then when it was challenged by the people who are receiving that, it's seen as a sign of aggression, rather than actually uh, just standing up for myself, which is what, uh, which is what I was taught to do. Um, so. Whereas the change rooms I, I experience now, don't get me wrong, these guys who are speaking like that, they're nice fellas, they're nice guys, and, 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 they'll, and they'll do, they do things, for, they'll be really supportive in terms of your development. But that was that what they were, uh, uh, was permitted in their times. And it's, it's the, the, the change now in what's permitted in a change room is completely different. Um, and in terms of discrimination, it's much it's for the better. No doubt about that, it's, it's for the better in terms of discrimination. Um, I would, a probably different argue, argument which, which would be had is, are we, are we developing um, people who are psychologically prepared to deal with real life challenges and everything because, and, the, and, and again, I'd argue, yeah, probably, because we can, actually have people who are more ready to prepare to stand up for themselves mm -hmm. and not just suffer in silence. Mm -hmm. When I was younger, when I was playing football, um, I didn't really see anyone who, who looked like myself as a North African um, playing football in Oxford. Um, do you think that seeing more people who look like yourselves has, has potentially helped us maybe bypass um, prejudice or improve on how we perceive prejudice in, in football in, in England? Question. For me, um, I think when I got to around 14, 15, I was playing for Oxford City this time, and I think my best friend started to come over and play. Um, she was obviously a, a black woman now, so for me that made me more confident. And I don't know, I'm saying it now, I don't know why it made me more confident, but it did. Um, and I felt like it was a bit of 
security in some sense because it was just me at that point. So when she come on, all of a sudden my football ability got better because I was more confident I felt in like I was in a safer environment. Um, and it's, it's talking about it's really hard to explain because you can't explain that feeling, but I felt more myself um, and I felt like I could be myself. So yeah, I think the more reputation, you know, that comes on, I do think it affects people's game. For me, it did. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing it in generations now where I do look at teams and I think, I don't know why, maybe it's just me, but I do look at a team and I say, well, where, where's the ethnicity in that team? Um, and it's growing, it is growing. But for me personally, it gave me a lot of confidence knowing that I had someone in my team that knows exactly what I'm going through sometimes. Um, and it made it a safer environment for me to play in, if I'm, if I'm honest. How, how do you see that now from a manager's standpoint? Yeah, I mean, like I said, like I coached today the Velocity Girls and we we are growing that ethnicity here. Um, but it's all about, as a manager, I think, getting but understanding them. So I can understand that. Um, and understanding them helps them on the pitch, it helps them grow as a player as well. And I think the more ethnicity we can bring into squads and, you know, round Oxford or teams in Oxford, again, it will make them players feel more comfortable. Um, it will make them feel like this is a safe environment to be in. And managers have to look at that. You know, if a player of ethnicity and you don't, maybe you don't know the religion or, uh, you know, information that you think you need to know, then do some research. Um, that's the best way as a manager you can make sure you're creating a safe environment and you're educating yourself. Um, but yeah, that's what I would say. To jump on the point, so there's a couple of really good points. The security factor is everything. The moment you feel secure, you do relax the shoulders back, you're more confident, it impacts on your well-being and performance. And from experience, that's what I felt. If I, again, it might be subconsciously or whatever, but if I saw more people who looked like me in a certain place and environment, it made me feel more, it makes me feel more secure. I would like to say that's a human instinct, I can't speak for anyone else, but that's how uh, I, I experienced it in a sporting setting. In terms of when you're from a managing point of view, when you're looking at your, your squad makeup, it's, it's not too dis dis dissimilar to society, to the school classroom, the school playground. The one who's different for whatever makeup or, or reason is an outsider. Whether that be your, your, your footballing ability, whether that be your, your shape, your size, your ethnicity, whatever, your, your culture, your language, if, if there's always going to be an outsider for whatever reason. And it is the responsibility of the coach, the manager, the responsible adult at, at that time to make the environment more, more inclusive for them. And that might be... Um, you, you, you use the point there of, of educating yourself. Nothing here, what I'm going to say, is going to be preach or anything, but having an awareness of what somebody might be going through or, or feeling is so important. And the, the, you, you talk about go do your research, just ask them. Just ask them. There, there's no shame in that. You can to, to do that with respectfully. Ask them. If anything, it will make them feel safer. Um, that you're actually taking interest and in you're trying to, you know, you're getting the facts you need as a manager. I think that would make me feel even more safe. If I was a player, if you was my manager and you're coming with me direct questions, and I'll, I'll probably be smiling. I'll be thinking, yeah, like they, they actually care, you know? And they're looking into that ethnicity side because I don't feel like that happens a lot, if I'm honest. Um, I think it's just get on with it. But like Eddie said, if, if that question could be asked, you know, could, could the ethnicity be growing in, in football? To move on to this month, okay, the month of October is of course Black History Month. Um, what what does that mean to you when you hear the term Black History Month? Do you do you hear that in a positive way or <coughs> a negative way, or are you somewhere in between? It, it depends what side of the bed you got me because sometimes I say it doesn't mean much to me at all. It doesn't mean much. What do you mean? There's a month dedicated to to Black people. What's that about? Mm -hmm. um, what I am for is championing the people who have come before in any walk of life, but we're talking about Black History right now, right now. So if there are pioneers or people who have had to run so you can walk, then we should absolutely be celebrating them. Absolutely, because it is gonna be a parents or grandparents, uh, their idol, their role model, their person who helped them 
uh, remove any barriers for, to, for them to access. And uh, absolutely at that point, <laughs> I, I don't see how you could not want to celebrate that or, or want to champion it. And like I say, you're, you're dedicating a month to it. <clears throat> it there are understandable arguments that you could say that actually is more, it's less inclusive and it's alienating and everything. But actually, it's it's not just Black History, it's Black History awareness. Mm -hmm. It's the awareness of it. It's the not. It's the because then you, it's someone's choice. I can give you, I can make you aware of something, and it's still your choice to go and research it or not, or look into it or not. And and therefore, it's not forced upon you. So don't feel like oh, I'm having to go along with this uh, initiative which I don't believe in or I don't think is right because they're not celebrating another initiative. It's all a choice. It's absolutely all a choice. And if you're <laughs> and, and and that's why some days I think no, it doesn't matter. Some days I, I think yeah, it is important because I can't understand people getting offended about things they've got a choice over. <laughs> do or don't watch. Do or don't listen. Do or don't read. That's your choice, and and, and live with that. For me, I, I personally think <clears throat> I'm saying Betty a little bit. It doesn't annoy me that it's just one month because. Why can't it be 12 months, you know? Why has it got to be special to one month? That's the one side of me that's like, why, why, can, why can it not be every month? Why do we have to dedicate one month and wait for that one month to talk about awareness of black people? Um, but yeah, on the other side, it is a month to have these conversations and help people be aware. And like Eddie said, not really educate, be aware of what is like wrong to say. Um, because I feel like that still needs to be better. I think people, do they, they need to be aware that you can't say certain words mm. or um, certain situations or actions may be seen as offensive. Mm. Uh, if we can send that awareness, then obviously it, it's putting that stop on racism and this it's going to have effect, hopefully, on even in the higher leagues, for example. Um, Kick Out does a great job with their campaign, but it happens with, behind closed doors, you know? Like, you might not say it on the pitch, but you can say it in change room. Uh, you can say a certain word in change room or you can do action in change room. Um, and that's kind of what we need to stop. So I believe Black History Month needs to be every month. Um, it, it shouldn't be dedicated to one month, but I'm happy it is here so we can broadcast this and make people aware of, you know, how to act sometimes. Alia, as, as a teacher um, and as a football manager, you're very big on education. Um, and we spoke previously about how this month should really be aimed for education. Um, can you give me any examples of, of things that may make you feel uncomfortable that you think people should be educated on? Yeah, so, and, and again, this is a massive awareness for me personally. Growing up, obviously my mum's from Wales, and my dad's from Caribbean, so my, my texture of hair is curly, it's Afro. Um, and there's been times in society where I've, I've felt like I've had to look like my friends who are white, for example. So, you know, there's a thing called hair relaxer. My mum would do that to my hair maybe like twice a month. Um, just so like if we was going to a sleepover, they could brush my hair as well. Do you know what I mean? So I weren't left out. That was something I think I realised I was different at that point. Uh, and then I got older and I thought, what, what am I changing my whole appearance to feel like I need to fit in? Um, but yeah, like the one thing for me is you can't touch my hair. Don't ask me to touch my hair because you're not touching my hair. I think that's so important. I think people see like, you know, big afros and they're like, oh my God, can I touch your hair? No, what, why do you feel the need to touch it? Yes, I get it's a different texture, but again, I'm telling you, as awareness, that's not, it's, it's not good to hear that. Um, or just scrunching or touching, it's just like, no, I wouldn't come over to you and just touch your hair. So um, why is why that? Why does it make a difference? Sorry to interrupt. No, why do you think that? Is, that? is that because your hair is part of your identity and or you're being invasive by just going, and, like, I'm not going to go, and, you're not going to come and, 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 and grab up my trainers or anything. I like know, that. it makes me feel... At that point when I was younger, um, it made me feel like I'm so different. Like, why does everyone want to touch my hair? But then if I ask to such, touch someone else's hair, it's like, why would you want to touch my hair for? Um, so what's the difference with mine? But I, I could understand because I get Afro, it looks soft, you know, you, you, I don't know how, but maybe you do want to touch it. But there's a line where it's like, why, why? For me, I, put, I still don't understand it to this day. Um, it's happened in work situations where people feel the need just to walk past me and touch my hair and I'm just like, but in society, for me personally, I've grown up with thinking that's okay. Mm -hmm. Even speaking about it now, like I've never actually stood up for myself in that situation, if I'm honest. When people do it, I just let it go because 
I feel like it's more of a hassle to have that conversation. But saying this now, if it did happen, I do need to spread more awareness and say, look, that's not okay. Don't do that again and leave it at that instead of them thinking it's okay because I'm actually leading them on to think it's okay by not telling them. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, in ed- like education awareness-wise, that, that's, that's a big thing for me. And it's literally, can I touch your hair? And it's, why would you think you can ask that question, you know? Um, and it's just awareness. Some people might be listening thinking, well, well, you just asked them to touch their hair, but it's not your hair they're touching. You don't know where their hand's been, for one. <laughs> Two, I have a lot of products in my hair. Yeah. Uh, and three, it takes longer. Do you know what I mean? So it's a longer process. Um, but for me, that's what I would love to spread awareness and education on. I think it's a, a great example of a microaggression um, that, that can happen both on a football pitch but just in general life and, and I think it's, it's a great point of education so thanks for that idea. In terms of breaking down barriers in football, both of you have made massive strides, strides in your careers. Um, when I was much younger I remember watching Eddie play for Oxford United. So what barriers do you think still exist for black players and coaches and how do you think they can be overcome? Very few for players. Mm-hmm in terms of accessing football because there's there's it's the, the things which are going to always be a barrier are going to be finance ability to travel um uh, ability to find a team or all, all those things but uh just your just being black just your uh, uh, ethnic background is less and less of a of a barrier for for black people, I would say. I think there's other ethnic minorities who have a bigger challenge at the company to, to, to get into football, especially to professional and higher le- levels. Um, I think that beyond being a player, there are still challenges. Um, uh, and I think that there's a number of things which are gonna get you through that. How are you, what's your ethic, what's your work ethic, all those things probably come ahead of that. Mm-hmm. And then your ethnicity might be a barrier at some point. In terms of, do I feel like opportunities are more difficult to access being black? Um, oh, I don't know. There's a couple of ways to see this. So I would say for myself, I've been fortunate. I've got in certain rooms. I've, but I, I've kind of attacked it and kind of like I know I need to do X, Y, and Z. I've gone to speak to and and, and I've, I've got off the sofa and done it mm-hmm. uh, to to this point. I've also seen people who have have struggled. Um, through lack of knowledge of where to go next or who to speak to and, and all of these things. So, yes, there's going to be barriers which exist due to ethnicity. They are, I would say, and I'm probably a example of it, that there are pathways to support that. Mm-hmm. There's pathways to support that. Um, and I've been part of governing bodies and schemes that have supported me to, to uh, access things which I didn't know exist. And that's probably the, the biggest thing. If you don't know it exists, you don't know where to go. Mm-hmm. And that's the challenge. Letting people know of, um, letting black people know, minority ethnicities know, mm-hmm. signpost, this is where you go for support in this area. Mm-hmm. And then it's up to you. The best I've always got is leveraging your network of your peers. Mm-hmm. What are you doing? What are you up to? How's work, life, career going, or all these things? Oh, you're interested, I see you do this piece of work. Where does that come from? Where are you looking to go with it next? And building those networks within your peers or people who you are acquainted with or you trust is a really effective way of making yourself ready for when an opportunity comes. Because don't have an opportunity which you ain't got and you're not prepared for because then that's not down to whatever makeup you are, that's down to, oh, you weren't ready. And that's probably the difference to me. So I always have a, a conflict in myself in terms of how much I should be pioneering or championing uh, 
uh, causes against what am I doing for myself and and what makes what puts me in a place to be able to speak to people or, or about these, these sort of things I'll put myself in that place through my work because I'm, I'm, I'm an educator I'm a coach I'm a mentor and therefore I deliver it's my business to deliver options to people I still I, I, I always say I can, I, I'll never really give advice I give options it's up to the individual to choose from there Elliot touching on that um, what, what barriers do you think can still be overcome? I know from speaking to people who play women's football, um, they, they say that it's there's a lack of diversity in women's football, not just on the pitch, but also in the crowd. Um, what, how can we overcome this? I mean, I think it's a tricky one. I think, like I said, growing up without my best friend, I think I would have struggled in terms of being in that environment where I had someone the same colour as me, um, being that, like that blanket, for example. Um, the older I got, and you know, I went to play for Chesson in London, um, and again, that was different for me. If I'm honest, totally different. I've gone from Oxford, and where it's you know, majority white in my team, um, to going to Chesson, where it's you know near North London, and seeing so many other players of colour, I'm thinking, wow, like, and automatically again, my football got better, and I enjoyed where I was, and I I do think it comes down to where you're based. I think Oxford. It, it's facts. Ethnicity-wise, seeing black players in the game is, is quite low. I think, you know, Oxford City women, our ethnicity is not where I want it to be at the moment, if I'm honest, and, and that's stuff that, that's something we need to work on and it will grow. But there's nothing really I think you can do. If you are brought up, regardless of your colour, playing football, you will play football. I think, that is there a barrier? I'm not really sure. I don't really think there is, if I'm honest. You can, like, if you work hard and you get yourself in that situation, or let's say I worked, I was younger, let's say I worked really, really hard, I got England trials. Would my colour be a barrier? I would never know. I wouldn't know. But I, I'm a big believer in if you put the work rate in, you're equal to everyone. Uh, you know, if me and Eddie, let's say, went for the same role or something, I don't know, we're both working hard, then we're both equal to that job role. I, I don't know if there is a barrier when um, it comes to that. So the challenge I was put to that is, the school I went to, which was in Oxford, was multicultural and blacks, whites, Asians was, was a similar proportion. And of that, nearly everybody played football. Of that, I go through how many still people uh, of color still playing football by the time we get to 16 and plus, that went lower. And I'm talking about a time where actually Families' lives are a bit make up different, and people are having to uh, probably under different pressures to provide in the home, so they choose a different lifestyle, which is going to be beneficial to them now. So they're having to go into works and trades straight away to support homes, and those are there's more barriers in that in within society, yeah, and the needs of the cultural needs of that person growing up in that family in that community probably as much of a barrier so the communities themselves are probably as much of a barrier as the systems as well um, because it is it is a different culture it, 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 in my culture it is where you, your parents take you to a point and you look after them mm -hmm. as soon as you can do you know what I mean mm -hmm. uh, that's something I, I, I believe in mm -hmm. and so and some people take to that degree and think right I'm 16 I need to work I need to go there so that's you, you kind of stop a dream to live in it to do the reality and what the awareness in cultural communities it could be that actually they're 16 they've got time let them develop find out where they need to go and then really might be able to provide for the family in, in, in future times let them have that time to grow and develop and see where they and see where they get to and a lot of pe my peers didn't have that opportunity and what can what could football, specifically football, do to support that is have education programs alongside football. Brilliant, now we've got one here. It's an education site, so it means you're that child whose family, they do believe in education and want them to grow up. You're getting both, you're getting it all. So that, that's systems, sports, government body, they shouldn't limit. They shouldn't limit, they shouldn't say, you can only do this or you can only do that. I believe 
wholly in dual careers and you should be able to learn and, and work and change your career after three or four years if you want to because you're still able to uh, take things on and those are the those are the barriers where I remember getting coached and saying oh you've got focus complete on your football where, yeah it's true but I can, I'm, I'm only a footballer when I'm playing football other than that I'm, I'm all these other things to different people all at the same time so I should be developing those as well and that's where I think uh, sports, football, in the uh, society as well. I think, when, when really thinking about barriers when I was younger, um, I went to a youth club called CDI, great youth club, um, and that's where my love for football came because it was just so enjoyable. But thinking about barriers now, I think we do need to go into more areas of Oxford um, and we do need to do more taster sessions and mini football matches, just use an example, be Blackbeast Field for example, just go and put a match on because to some people, and it's free, that it's affordable, they can go play, they can go enjoy, because when you get into youth teams or, you know, actual teams, they're subs, it's, it's life, you know, you know, money is going up, and for me, that's when the barrier starts. Um, yeah, as soon as cost is As soon as cost comes, in, comes into play, it's, you know, it was £2 when I was younger for subs, if I'm honest, you paid £2 to train. Um, but now, you know, some clubs charge over £300, um, yeah. and it's like, and it's like, um, you know, how, how, how can everyone afford that? I mean, we're not that expensive, but it's, it's an example of some clubs do. But I get why, because I've been you know, in that line of work and I can understand where the money goes. But for someone that's in that community um, and they've been going to them free session, they've enjoyed it, how are they going to take the next step? Because that's the barrier. But it's hard because you can't say, right, that's fine, we just remove all the money because you won't have a club. Um, but we... I think we, as a society, need to do more in terms of go into them communities, do them little sessions, and inspire people. Um, but the barrier for me is the price, the cost of actually joining a team, um, which is just the world we live in. Everything's gone up; we can't change that. But when actually thinking about it, that 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 was a barrier when I was growing up. I think paying two pound and then going to my first club and then telling my mum it cost this much and seeing her face was like probably not going to happen then. Um, but Again, I showed that I really wanted to do it, and um, my mum invested in me. So, you know, it works in work rate and it works in both, doesn't it? But for me, that was a barrier, and I think it still is. I wanted to speak about media portrayal um, and how how does the media treat uh, footballers of um, mixed heritage or black heritage, um, and has that changed over over the last few years? Do you think it's become better, or do you think it's still uh, not in a great position. So there's more initiatives which to actual, I want to say tangible, don't, don't, which actually are aiming to provide life skills, career prospects, employment opportunities, um, uh, well-being uh, aspects. So there's, there are schemes out there which are aiming to support that. Mm -hmm. They'll get it wrong along the way in terms of what they do and sometimes they might go too far in I know that I've had access to courses at a fraction of the prices a peer of mine, a counterpart who's white. Um, and the argument goes, it's okay, it's disproportionate that, so we can start to readdress the balance and, and make it proportional to what it should be. Absolutely fine. Uh, but uh, again, as a community, you don't want it to go completely one-sided one way. Uh, un uh, you don't want it to get skewed one way. So then there's animosity towards somebody succeeding or anything like that when actually we're just providing equity here. Mm -hmm. So um, I definitely feel that people are more, <laughs> for want of a better word, I want to say woke in a positive way because that's, even that's gone completely skewed now. Isn't it? And if you're woke, that's one of the biggest insults you can give me. But um, in, in terms of being conscious, being aware, having, a, a, do you know what it is? It's thinking before you do things. Has there been thought taken place into why you speak to that person that way and one person that way? Have you thought about that? If you haven't, please do. Think about it because it might actually change the way you behave towards that person and the impact of that on that person might be so significant that it changes 
somebody else's day, you make somebody else's day, and, and, that, and it rolls on like that. And I do, again, <laughs> believe in the, in the the power of impact in one person and the knock-on effect is, 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 is really, really big. Yeah, I'm quite similar with you, Eddie, I think, I think media is just media. I think everyone's going to have their own opinion on it, positive, negative. Um, but I personally think it's what happens in society. So if there's, you know, a case of high racism, um, for example, there was at one time, I remember looking at the newspaper and it, was just, it would just be about racism in the game and what's happened. Yeah, no, zero balance. Nothing, yeah, because the society, society at that point is all about racism. Um, front page, front page, maybe two weeks later, it's gone. Um, but it's still there, it's silent, it's still there, but the media doesn't cover it because it's not society, it's not talking about it right now. Um, so, yeah, my opinion on media, you know, positive, negative, everyone's going to have one. But for me, it focuses on what's important at that time. If something's highlighted in a game about racism, I guarantee that will be on um, positive or negative, I don't know, because I don't know if I'm honest, I don't read it. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll challenge you. So I'll challenge you on. You say it focuses on what's important at time. It focuses. I feel that media focuses on what's divisive. Yeah, what can divide people's thoughts? Yeah, yeah. That's where I think media is at, and I and because of that, you get views which are so contrasting, which are presented to us, and you have to be one side. You have to be one or the other. Well, actually, uh, you don't, because it can be uh, uh, along that spectrum. You can you can think some things or that person uh, 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 what you believe in some things or that and where the media so devices making people choose causing conflict yeah. that's, that's where it's at right now and it's, unhe- it's quite it's a, it can be unhealthy when it's that imbalanced whereas I feel media is absolutely great I'm a, I'm a, uh, I, I definitely feel that uh, media is can be used so powerfully. You know, the Marcus Rashford campaign um, is, is, is fantastic and he can reach more than newspapers can these days with one tweet, do you know what I mean? So the power of media is absolutely there and it's, and it's golden if used, if used uh, proportionately. So I'm not saying that's good media, that's bad. I'm just saying if there's a balance to it, then great. If there's not, then it becomes dangerous. Yeah, I think media's, I think media's really important, especially uh, for what I do in terms of for the club and trying to get more girls into football, more women into football, I'm actually now trying to get more parents, um, you know, doing their their courses. Um, so a lot, of, sort of the parents' mums, I'm trying to get them involved into the FA in terms of doing their badges, etc. And that comes down to user media. Uh, different types of social media or media is media for me. So it can be used in such a positive light. Like you said, Marcus Rashford, there's other campaigns kick it out that I know got really big through using media. Um, but again, on the other side, like you said, there has to be a balance because at points they do divide people. And when you divide people, that's when, arg- well not arguments, but opinions get shared. That's when comments get shared. And then that's when racism can occur. If it's about that at that point, if that makes sense. So I feel like it's brilliant for some things, but other things, I feel like it, it wants to start that, that little battle um, and again, I don't know why, it's just media, but yeah, it can be used in a positive light. I have two questions. Uh, one is very much towards Eddie about your new role at the Oxfordshire FA. Um, how do you think you can impact change? Yeah, I didn't join lightly. Uh, I did give a, a lot of thought in a, in a few conversations beforehand because exactly that, what am I going to do about it? What's, what could I do to support or to impact change? Um, and I was, I f- ultimately I, I thought, well, if I don't try, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Uh, and and for I find myself in a position where I'm being afforded this opportunity. Okay, let's let's see what actually can be done and make sure it's, let's try and make it meaningful. Have a have a legacy where something improves or somebody's experience in, in, in improves because of something that I've supported, being able to help mentor somebody, being able to uh, challenge in the boardroom and ask, okay then, that's, why does that happen? Why has that not, not changed for so long? Why do we do it in this way? And because one of the most harmful things you can hear back, dangerous things, is we've always done it that way. If I hear that, then I, I'm, that's gonna make me want to go into it more and explore 
why have you always done it that way? Because is that is that healthy, or can there something be done to actually support more people in a more impactful way? So, um, hopefully, I've answered your question there. I, I, it was an opportunity which I felt was too great to turn down because um, I don't know if not me then who. Yeah, excellent. Um, I think that's 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 well put, Eddie. Um, <laughs> And the final question is, um, coming back to Black History Month and looking at it beyond October, um, how do you think we can keep the momentum, the momentum of Black History Month going throughout the year in football and also in other, in other walks of life? I think that's quite tricky because I, for me, I'm so passionate about it. Mm -hmm. I just think it should be something every, we all think about, you know, but obviously I do understand, but yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I'm just thinking of myself as a manager, as a coach, you know, as head of women football at City. How can I, how can I make sure that's more seen? I think that's a great question that I would actually go away, and actually look at how I can embrace that more in the club. Actually, mm -hmm. for me, go home, look at siblings, parents, family members, your peers. Those are where your true role models should should be occurring, and where they where they should be happening, and. Those those day to day people, the day to day heroes who who who, uh, who support you, um, your, your teachers, your coaches, your stuff. Just, just, they're all around. They're all around. Um, Eli, Anthony, and Yoni Ambo, thank you so much for your time. And um, yeah, good luck for the season. Yes, thank you.